If somebody says it's wrong, I think we should listen respectfully. He might have an argument. But it should be clear from the beginning that the ball's in his court. You want to say that everybody's wrong. The default position is that you're wrong. OK? Could be that everybody's making a mistake. Could happen. But unless you give a good, convincing argument, then the appropriate conclusion is that you're wrong. The fact that people have been wrong, that everyone has been wrong in the past, is no reason to just discard what everyone believes to be true and make it neutral. After all, think about yourself. I suppose you've been wrong at least once or twice. Does that mean we should just discard everything you think is true because you happen to have made one or two mistakes? Probably not. Probably not. If something that everybody believes is correct, someone wants to contest it, we should listen respectfully. But the burden of proof is on him to present a convincing argument. Now, everyone in the world classifies what they do and what other people do as either selfish or generous. We do that all the time. We are proud of ourselves in generous moments, and we are distressed with ourselves. We do something selfish. And we classify and discuss and analyze other people's actions in this, in this matter. As far as I've been able to tell, this is cross-cultural. Um, it seems like this is a universal human practice. Someone wants to tell us that this is all a gigantic mistake. Well, let's hear a good, solid argument. Now, there are people who have tried to say, tried to defend the idea that everything everyone does is always selfish. Everything, always, under all conditions, is only selfish. That's a very universal idea. That rules out our universal commitment to classifying actions as sometimes selfish and sometimes generous. Let's hear what they have to say. Let's hear what kind of argument they can present. Now, I'm familiar with two arguments, and I'll tell you how I would deal with them. If you're familiar with arguments that I'm not familiar with, I'll be happy to hear them and see what we can do about them. One argument goes like this. The, let's call him the cynic. Cynic says, here's how I'm going to proceed. I'm going to present, I'm going to ask you for your best case of an altruistic action, a generous, selfless action. And I'll show you that your best case is wrong. I'll show you your best case is wrong. Then, of course, all the other cases that you could think of are also going to be wrong. OK, I say, I'm willing to take the test. It's January 3rd in Chicago. The wind sleet index is minus 22 degrees. And George is driving along in his car, and he sees another car parked by the side of the road with, now, dating myself historically, with a white handkerchief tied to the radio aerial. There was a time when people advertised they were in trouble because other people would stop. That would never happen today. No one would stop. They'd be afraid of being shot dead. But there was a time when that happened. You can read it in history books. So George stops, and he says to the guy, what's wrong? He says, I don't know. The car stopped dead, and it's sleeting, and I don't know what to do. So George says, listen, I happen to know something about cars. Open up the hood. He opens up the hood. He fools around in there for 10 minutes. Close the hood, says, start her up. Turns the key. There was a time when they did it with keys instead of voice control or something. <laughs> and the car starts up and drives away. Now, George does not identify himself in any way. His uh, license plate is covered with snow, so the poor victim couldn't read his license plate. He will never be identified by the victim. He'll never be paid back for what he did. I say to the cynic, there's my example. I think that was a purely generous action. And that seems to me this. This is a purely generous action. There are other ones. Your universal thesis that everybody, always under all conditions, does everything solely for his own benefit is simply wrong. Here's the counterexample. The cynic says, let's examine your case a little more carefully. Tell me something. As George drives away, how did he feel? How did he feel? Didn't he feel some satisfaction? Didn't he feel good about himself? Maybe that's something sort of bolstering his self-image, his self-respect. And I have to admit that's probably true. He probably does feel good about what he did. So the cynic says, and feeling good is a pleasure, isn't it? I guess so. When you feel good about yourself, that's pleasant. Now, says the cynic, what would have happened if he passed him by? How do you think George would have felt if he passed him by? Well, 
I guess he would have felt guilty, you know, like a, a cad, you know, un, uh, ungenerous and unfeeling for someone else's distress. Right, says the cynic. Now tell me, when a person feels bad about himself, when he feels like he's, he's selfish, he feels like a cad, uh, isn't that painful? And I said, well, I guess so. You feel bad about yourself? You're disappointed in yourself? That's painful. So, the cynic says, by stopping and helping the guy, he got pleasure. Had he not stopped and helped the guy, he would have gotten pain. There you have it. He did it for the sake of the pleasure that he got and the pain that he avoided. That's selfish. Stopping to help somebody with a broken car by the side of the road is no different from buying yourself an ice cream cone. You do it for the sake of the pleasure. And you, says the cynic, you told me this was your best case. The best case of a generous, selfless action. So I have shown you that even in this case it's selfish, you have to admit that all the other cases are selfish as well. Okay, that's a very popular, dare I say, sophomoric, very popular argument that people um, use in this context. Is the argument clear? Okay, the argument is dead wrong. It's dead wrong. And what I'm saying now is not controversial in philosophical terms. The argument confuses a byproduct of an action with the purpose of the action. All the argument shows is that when George stops and helps the stranded driver, the effect is he feels good. He gets pleasure. All the cynic has shown is that had he not stopped <coughs> and driven on, the effect would have been pain. That only shows that stopping produces pleasure. That failing to stop would have produced pain. It doesn't show that that was the purpose of the action. To be selfish, it's not enough that you get pleasure or avoid pain. It has to be that the purpose of the action is, is pleasure and avoidance of pain. And nothing in the cynic's argument shows that. Just to make the difference between the purpose and the byproduct, I hope crystal clear, let me give you an extreme example. About 10 years ago, the Mississippi River flooded, overflowed and flooded on 1,000 miles, 1,500 miles of its path. And cities were swamped, and there was a lot of loss of, uh, of property. Some, I don't know if they died, but people were in danger of dying. Now imagine that George lives in Santa Monica, and he's watching this on the television. Boy, those poor people. You know. As the river was swelling and coming downstream, so then certain cities were building sandbag dikes to try to hold back the water and the question whether they would finish in time. And he says, I can't let them do this. I can't let them do this alone. Gets into his car and drives for 36 hours to the Midwest, five days down from where the Mississippi is at the moment. And he joins the crew of people building a sandbag wall against the river. He's hauling sandbags two, three days till the river gets there. He drives back to Santa Monica. A couple of months later, he's telling this experience that he had to a friend. The friend said, tell me something. You were there for three days. You're hauling 100-pound bags of sand for three days. Do you think that that increased your muscular strength? So George says, yes, so. <laughs> Three days, hours and hours of dragging 100 pound, 100 pound weights? I'll bet it did. And his friend said, that's why you did it. You did it to increase your muscular strength. It was selfish all the way. I hope that's not persuasive. Um, he did get a benefit. It's true. He did increase his muscular strength. But that was not the purpose of his action. That was just a byproduct. It was just an outcome of the action. Showing that an action produces pleasure and avoids pain, does nothing to show that that was the purpose of the action. That has to be argued further and independently. And nothing that the cynic has set up until now does that further job. So the argument, so far as we have it on the table, is a flop. Are we together? I just add now a little footnote. The reason why the cynic presents this argument is because sometimes the person who defends altruism makes a false challenge for himself. He wants to prove altruism. How's he going to prove that the person didn't do it for pleasure? So the altruist tries to find the case where there's no pleasure involved. 
None at all. If there's no pleasure involved, then obviously he didn't do it for pleasure. So the cynic can say, you're not going to accomplish that, because whenever somebody sets out to do something and succeeds in doing what he wanted to do, there will be a pleasure involved. I agree. I think that's correct. But that doesn't show it was the purpose. That doesn't show it was the purpose. So far, the cynic hasn't got it. Here's a second argument. It's really a one-liner that, uh, that uh, cynics use. Everything you do, you want to do. You do it because you want to do it. Even if someone puts a gun to your head and says, do this or I'll kill you, you want to stay alive. <laughs> That's why you do it. Maybe you wouldn't have wanted to do this had he not put a gun to your head. But once he puts a gun to your head, you want to stay alive, and that's why you do it. Everything you do ultimately is because you want to do it. Well, if you're doing it because you want to do it, then it must be that it's selfish. Here's a little test of your understanding. This makes the same mistake. This makes the same mistake. Because, true, I do whatever I do because I want to do it. But that doesn't identify what the object of the want is. What is it that I want? Maybe very well be that I want something good for you. I do it because I want it, but what I want is something good for you. That doesn't make it selfish. On the contrary, if what I want is something good for you, then it's altruistic, it's generous, it's not selfish. Derek Parfit, who is a very eminent British philosopher at Oxford, who wrote a masterpiece called What Matters, two volumes, 1,400 pages, which so far I've read twice, um, brilliant piece of philosophy, um, answers this argument in one short paragraph. He says the word want has two uses, at least two. And you can illustrate the two uses of the word want in the following little dialogue. Peter and Paul are trying to decide what to do on Sunday afternoon. Peter wants to go mountain climbing, and Paul wants to play chess. So there's a gap between them. Peter thinks it over, calls up Paul, and he says, you know, I've been thinking it over, but I've decided what I really want to do is what you want to do, and not what I want to do. Let's try that again. What I really want to do is what you want to do, and not what I want to do. Now, if he's saying, I really want to do what I don't want to do, then there's got to be two uses of the word want. And the two uses are very simple. Sometimes want means, this will give me pleasure. Sometimes want means, all things considered, this is what I have judged that I'm going to do. Those are two entirely different uses of the word want. And what Peter is saying to Paul is, all things considered, I've made the judgment that I want to do what, in fact, will give you pleasure and won't give me pleasure. And that means the want that motivates the action, the want that produces the action, is not the want for pleasure. It's the want that's associated with, and all things considered, judgment. And that is not obviously aimed at his own pleasure or his own benefit. So those are the two arguments that I know of that cynics put in favor of the idea that everything we do is selfish, and they are flops. Now, where are we now? As a logician, let's just take stock. The cynic has tried to prove his case and failed. What do we know now? We know nothing. The cynic has tried to prove his case and failed. He might be right. He might be, have other proofs. There might be other proofs yet to be discovered that prove he's right. It doesn't prove that we're right. It just means we're in doubt. We don't know whether the cynic's right or whether the natural opinion of all human beings is right. At this point, we're in Ignorance. We're in a neutral position. Right? This is very important because this is a failure of logic that's very, very common. They ask somebody to prove his case. When he fails to prove his case, you then conclude, well, then he's wrong. No, he's not wrong. He's not wrong. In order to prove him wrong, you have to prove you're right, and you haven't done that yet. Okay. Can we show that we're right? I think we can. It's not me now. This is Bishop Butler, who is a bishop of the Anglican Church in Britain and also a noted philosopher, and he put forth an argument on this matter. Now, for the, for the re recordings here, there are various versions and portrayals of, Butch of Butler's argument, and some of them are more or less successful. I'm portraying it best as I understand it. If somebody wants to fight the textual battle and say that's not really what he meant, oh, it's fine with me. I don't mind. Um, I, 
and they even call it Gottlieb's argument <laughs> or Gottlieb's Butler argument. But uh, I think the following argument works. Let's start with distinguishing two types of pleasures. Maybe there are more, but there are at least two different types of pleasures. There are certain things that you are hardwired, hardwired to feel pleasure when they happen. Just the way normal human beings are constructed biologically. Second type of pleasure is satisfaction. You want something and you get it. The desire to have it is satisfied and satisfaction is a pleasure. It's a type of pleasure. The two are quite different. In particular, you can't have a pleasure or satisfaction unless you have a desire that gets satisfied. Whereas the first type of pleasure you can have without any desire at all. You will all experience this when you give the first taste of ice cream to your baby. Let's say you're eight month old or you're 10 month old. You come at the baby with a, with a spoon with ice cream on it and the baby is wary. Never seen this before and he's pretty clever. He's, you know, he knows what he's seen before and he hasn't. You touch his lips, it's cold and he's not familiar with the consistency. He may draw away until he gets a taste. He gets a taste, he's hooked. He's hooked because it's an instant pleasure, right? You're not satisfying any desires. He had no desire for that at all. He's just wired to feel that pleasure. That's a hardwired uh, pleasure. Of course, of course, having experienced it, having experienced the pleasure, he may now form a desire for the pleasure. That's quite natural. Next time, he might get a double pleasure. He might get the hardwired pleasure of the taste of the ice cream, plus the satisfaction of his desire to have more ice cream for the sake of that pleasure. There's no, they're not exclusive. These pleasures can, can double up. But there's a difference between a hardwired pleasure and a satisfaction pleasure. That's step one. Now, step two, there are cases where you do something, you engage in something, try to accomplish something, where the only pleasure available is a pleasure of satisfaction. There's no hardwired pleasure available whatsoever. In other words, you want it. You're going after what you want. If you get it, you'll satisfy your desire for it. But if you didn't want it, there'd be no pleasure in it at all. It's only because you want it that there's a pleasure. For example, you are trying to encourage your eight-year-old cousin to have an interest in playing chess. So you have challenged him to a game of chess, and your goal is to artfully lose. Make it seem to him that it's a real competition and make it seem to him from time to time that you lost track and let him feel that there was a, a, a competition in the game and he'll win and because he'll win, he'll be encouraged and you'll say, look, you obviously have some talent so you should play more chess. That's your goal in setting up this game. But as it happens, your poor eight-year-old cousin is much worse than you thought. He makes blunders and um, gets confused. And, th and then w when he makes a bad move, he catches himself. Oh, I've lost the rook. I've lost the rook. Now, at this point, you can't pretend. You can't pretend you didn't see it because he, he's noticed it himself. And one by one, you start taking off his pieces because you can't help it until he's swamped and he loses the game. You've won. You've won the game. Do you have any pleasure from that? I don't think so because... You didn't want to win. <laughs> you wanted to artfully lose. And beating an eight-year-old doesn't give you any credit at all. Because the only pleasure available here is a pleasure of satisfaction. And the desire that led you to play the game of chess with him wasn't satisfied. You ended up with no pleasure. There are times when the only pleasure that's available in a certain type of activity is a pleasure of satisfaction. So if there wouldn't be a desire, there would be no pleasure. I hope all of what I said so far is obvious and boring, right? That there are two different types of pleasures, hardwired and satisfaction, and also that there are times when there's a pleasure only of satisfaction. We got it so far? Because now I'm going to lower the boom. Okay, so that's good. If the two premises are very obvious and simple, then the conclusion is very, very strongly supported, right? Imagine... A case where the only pleasure available is a pleasure of satisfying a desire. What is the object of that desire? 
Is the object of that desire pleasure? Is the desire, desire going after pleasure? The conclusion from what I said so far is that it cannot be. That desire cannot be a desire for pleasure. That's probably not obvious. So let me show you why it's true. <laughs> because imagine the desire here was to lose the game to the eight-year-old. That was the desire. The goal of that desire, we say, is to lose the game to the eight-year-old. The only pleasure available is if I lose the game to the eight-year-old, I'll satisfy the desire, and satisfying the desire will give me a pleasure. That's the only pleasure available. Now the cynic says, yeah, yeah, I know what you say, but really the desire is for pleasure. Okay, but that would mean that there are two pleasures available. Not one, but two. The desire is aimed at a pleasure, and when the, ple when the desire gets what it wants, there'll be another pleasure of satisfaction. And we are describing this as a case where there's only one pleasure available, not two. Let's go through it again. Sometimes I have a blackboard. And I draw a desire as a big monster with big teeth, big open mouth. Right? Desire wants to get something. Desire has an object that it wants to get. Whatever that object may be, if you feed the object to the desire, the desire is satisfied. Feeding the object to the desire, giving the desire what it wants, satisfies the desire, and the result is a pleasure. The pleasure comes from satisfying the desire. If I imagine a situation where the only pleasure available is a pleasure that comes from satisfying a desire, then the whole scenario is the desire is there, it's aimed at Q. When it gets Q, having Q satisfies it and produces a pleasure. That's the only pleasure in the picture. Question, what is Q? Q can't be a pleasure because then you have two pleasures in the picture. You have Q and then you have the pleasure of the desires getting Q and becoming satisfied. And that's simply wrong. There's only one pleasure available. So Q can't be a pleasure. In the case of the eight-year-old, the, the, the object of desire, what the desire is after is to artfully lose the game to the eight-year-old. That's its object. If it gets its object, then there'll be a pleasure for the agent because he got what he wanted, because his desire to artfully lose was satisfied. There's nothing in the art for losing this pleasant. It's because he wanted to artfully lose that he got a pleasure. Though artfully losing is not itself a pleasure, it's pleasurable to him because it satisfies his desire to artfully lose. If he was trying to win an artfully loss, he wouldn't have any pleasure at all <laughs> because he didn't win. That means, this is this, I, what I believe is Bishop, Bishop Butler's argument, that means that we definitely have desires for things other than pleasure. Are we together so far? Okay, that doesn't win the day. That doesn't win the day. The cynic has a comeback. But it's progress. Because it means some of my motivations are not motivations for pleasure. There was a time when people wanted to argue that every single desire and every single motivation is only for pleasure. If that were true, the cynic would hands down. No, now we know some of our, our um, desires, some of our motivations are not for pleasure. But the cynic has a fallback position. He could say, okay, okay, I see that in fact sometimes we desire things other than pleasure, but maybe we only desire them as means to other pleasures or to pleasures. Maybe they're only as means. If I desire X and X isn't a pleasure, when I act to get X, I'm not acting to get a pleasure, but it might be that X is a means to a later pleasure, which means the only thing I desire as an end is pleasure. A person works to get money. I hope this doesn't come as a surprise, but there's very little you can do with $700, $100 bills. You can't, you know, stare at them, um, put them in a can, shake them. No, you have to buy something with them. So they're only a means. The $100 bills don't uh, give you pleasure. They give you the means to buy something else. The something else might be something which gives you pleasure. So now the cynic says, I agree that sometimes you act for things that aren't pleasure, but I claim that when you ask why you want that other thing, you'll have a chain. I want A for B, B for C, and C for D. And I want D because it'll produce pleasure. And then what you, all, all the things you want as an end are pleasurable. And that being the case, your value, what you're aiming at, is always only pleasure, and that's good enough for the cynic. 
I think that's true that the, the conclusion is good. If he could show that, the conclusion is good. But at this point, the cynic is giving no reason to think he's right. He just says, I think that whenever you go out to something that isn't pleasure, it's a means to get pleasure. Okay, it's a free world. You can think what you like. Why should I take you seriously? You're just saying that. Before he had what sounded like arguments in his favor. Now he's just opting to take this position against everybody else in the world. I think at that point, we have every right to just dismiss him. You've just opted to go against everybody in the world with no reason. That's not, that's not worthy of being taken seriously. But I think we could do better than that. I think we can if you analyze the way people's psychology work, um, you can see that, that that's, that's, that's not correct. Where's the end of the chain? Where's the end of the chain of things that we want? We want A for B, and B for C, and C for D. We get something. I'm talking psychology, psychology now. This is not philosophy. It's not logic. I'm not forcing any opinions on anybody. I'm just talking about how people actually work. Let me say to somebody, you're working at a job. Why do you work at the job? To earn money. Why are you earning money? Because I want to buy a house. Why do you want to buy a house? Because I want to live in a house. Why do you want to live in a house? Because it's very pleasant to live in a house. I live in an apartment. I anticipate living in a house will be very, very pleasant. I said, why do you want to do what's very, very pleasant? He says, are you serious? Why do I want to do what's very, very pleasant? Why? Because it's pleasant. <laughs> There's no other reason beyond this being pleasant. I'm not doing what's pleasant for some other reason. I'm doing it because it's pleasant. That's the end of it. I want that pleasant experience or that pleasant quality of life. That's perfectly reasonable. Not everybody would give that answer, but it's perfectly reasonable. It means pleasure is perfectly reasonable as an end that people have where other things lead up to it, and that's an end of the chain where it's not for the sake of something else. But I don't think that's the only example. I'll give you two other examples. Somebody sees me handing $500 to another person. He says, why are you doing that? Why are you giving me $500? I say, why? Because I borrowed $500 from him, and I'm paying the debt. And why are you paying the debt? Why am I paying the debt? I borrowed the money. I, I owe him the money. When I borrow money, I pay it back. That's what I do. Yeah, but why are you paying it back? At that point, it may be, it doesn't always have to be, but it could be that there's no further why. There's no further goal. When I borrow money, I pay it back. That's what I do. That's how I live. That's just my principle. I might say, because it's right, but that's no more than saying I'm committed to doing it. Committed to doing it for its moral quality. And it doesn't have any further. I think that's perfectly understandable, personally reasonable, and I think it is common that people will tell you that they do things, and they do them because they're right, and they don't do the right thing for some other purpose. Some people may do it for other purposes. I'm not putting any restrictions on people. I'm just making room for another type of example. A third type. Um, I see that you are working on your interpersonal sensitivity. You're reading novels about people in trouble, and you're trying to experience their pain vicariously so that you can, when you come across such a person, you can empathize with such a person. You're talking to people. You're getting psychological uh, help as to strategies as to how to improve your interpersonal sensitivity. Why are you doing that? person may say, look, I've lived for a while. I've had some experience of the world. It seems to me this is part of my ideal, the best way I can be. I have a picture of myself, what I would like to be, a picture of myself that I think would make me the best that I can be, and this is part of it. I want to make myself into the best person I can be, and interpersonal sensitivity is an important part of that. So I'm working to improve my interpersonal sensitivity. But why are you trying to be the best person you could be? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mean, that's the best person I could be. So that's why I'm doing it. Why am I wanting to be? Because that's the best I could be. There's nothing further. Than, I'm not going to make more money, and I'm not going to have to sleep better, and so on and so on. It's a goal. It's a goal that attracts me, and I'm acting on that basis. Seems to me that also is perfectly reasonable. Perfectly natural. I think people act that way often. And there, although I'm acting for the sake of something about me, it's not pleasure. It's not pleasure. 
It's being the best person that I can be. And if the critic sneaks back in and says, but don't you feel good when you're the best person you can be? The answer to that will be, yes, but that's the byproduct. That's the byproduct. That's George's increased muscular strength when he goes back to Santa Fe. He went to help the people prevent themselves from being swamped by the river. And his muscles got stronger as a result. I want to be the best person I can be. And when I achieve what I want, I get pleasure. But the pleasure is from the wanting to be the best person. It wasn't the goal in my action. Let me illustrate this in my last shot. And I'll take questions on this. Then I'll show you how the Jewish application is. The, one of the books on ethics, they tell the following story. Now, this may be a true story or maybe apocryphal, but it makes the point very nicely. Abe Lincoln was driving in a wagon with a friend of his, and Lincoln was taking the cynic's line. Everybody, everything that you do is always only for the sake of your own benefit. And his friend was appalled. And, you know, and as they're driving along, they come to a bridge over a, 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 a narrow river, and the side of the big uh, of the river, there's a bog. And caught in the bog are young pigs. They're caught and they're squealing. Lincoln tells the driver to stop the wagon. And he gets out and he wades into the mud. And he frees the baby pigs one by one, getting, of course, filthy with mud in the process, and climbs back into the wagon, into the carriage, and they drive off. And Lincoln's friend says to him, hey, I don't get you. <laughs> You're telling me that everything you do is only for the sake of your own pleasure, your own benefit. How could you possibly say that? You just got yourself filthy with mud to free squealing pigs from a bog. How could you possibly think that that was only for your own pleasure, your own benefit? Now, Lincoln gives back the argument of the cynic. Do you know how I feel now? Muddy as I am, I feel terrific a fellow creature that was in pain and in distress and in danger is now running free and happy and, and, and out of danger. I feel wonderful that I did. This is an antecedent of Peter Singer. I feel wonderful that I did that for a fellow creature. And if we had gone by and had not stopped, I had not stopped to help the, the piglets, so I wouldn't have been able to sleep tonight. I would hear the squealing of the pigs in my, in my, in my, in my head and I wouldn't be able to sleep. I just did it for my pleasure. And, not, and to avoid pain. Now, I'm not remember whether the story stops there, but the right next step is for the friend to say to Lincoln, okay, Abe, I hear what you're saying, but tell me something. Don't you know that there are people who aren't like you? There are people who will drive by and hear the pig squealing and go on without another thought, without another thought. It wouldn't bother them at all. They wouldn't hear the echoes of the cries of the pigs in their sleep and destroy their sleep. They wouldn't feel guilty. They'd go by without, a he without hesitation. And furthermore, Abe, take one of those people, put a gun to his head, and say, I order you to free the pigs. He would not feel good about feeling the pigs. He'd just look for a way to toss you in the mud. <laughs> wouldn't feel good about it. If he wasted his time, did that to save his life. He wouldn't have any satisfaction. I'm giving it away. He would have any pleasure whatsoever from, from freeing the pigs. Tell me, Abe, what's the difference between you and him? Why is it that you got pleasure from freeing them and would feel bad about yourself if you didn't? And he's the opposite from you. He feels fine about himself if he passes them by, and if you force him to help, he feels terrible. What's the difference? The difference is that you want to help creatures in distress, and he doesn't care. You have the desire to help creatures in distress. When you succeed in doing what you want, you get the pleasure of satisfaction. If you don't help them in distress, then you have the pain of frustration. He doesn't have the desire, so there's no pleasure available for him if he frees them, and there's no pain uh, that will be caused by his not freeing them because he doesn't have the desire. That shows that your desire is not a desire for pleasure. On the contrary, your desire is a desire to help creatures in distress. And the pleasure comes from satisfying the desire, and the pain would come from not satisfying the desire. That doesn't show that everything you want is pleasure. What it shows is that you want to help creatures in distress, 
and you get pleasure when you succeed in doing what you want to do, as is true for everybody. But that's the byproduct. That's the byproduct. It's not the goal. Therefore, there's no merit in cynic's case whatsoever. Are we together so far? Now, as I say, this is pretty common in philosophy. Psychology has picked up on this. Aristotle knew this <clears throat> 2,300 years ago. He pointed out that happiness, the people who dedicate themselves to chasing happiness, very often are not happy. And very often the people who are happiest are the people who are doing something else. But they're doing something that's meaningful to them and they're successful at it, and that's what makes them happy. Happiness is most often a byproduct of doing something else that you care about, that you value, and that at which you are successful. Now, this is all very important in Jewish terms because the Torah specifies a great many actions that need to be done, but the idea of an action for the Torah and for philosophy also is not just moving your body. An action is not just moving your body. An action is a purpose which is acted upon by the will, often with a choice of means as well. Without that, you don't have an action, you just have an happening. Let me exp uh, describe this to you. What's the difference between kicking a ball in a soccer game or tripping and as you're falling, your, your foot banging against the ball and sending, sending it flying? What's the difference? In both cases, your, the contact of your foot with the ball made the ball move. <clears throat> but we say, when I kick the ball in a soccer game, that's an action. When I trip and fall and on the way down, my leg comes in contact, my foot comes in contact with the ball, the ball moves, is an accident. We call it an accident. Both are bodily motions. Both have contact the foot with ball. The ball moves in both cases, but only one is an accident. One is an action. What's the difference? In a soccer game, I choose. My goal is to get the ball there, and I think if I kick it with my right foot, with this part of my toe, with this type of spin, with this type of, of, of force, I'll get it there, and I choose to kick. Choose to kick in order to get the ball over there. That's what an action is. Action is not just a... Now, that means when you define an action, you have, to, you have to specify what the purpose is. You have to specify what the person's picture of the, of the relevant environment is, how he chose the means to achieve the action. Change any of those, and you have a different action. Even though the bodily motion may be the same, you have a different action. I lived through the Vietnam riots. The students took over buildings on campuses, and they sat in uh, crossroads of, of busy intersections and stopped the traffic. It was a great debate in legislatures. What to do? Some were in favor of forced repression, call out the National Guard, and beat them up and put them in jail. Others had other strategies. There were two groups in favor of forcible repression, the far left and the far right. The far right said, these students are, are, are criminals, and they're bums, and they're, they're schnooks, because they're young. Beat them up and put them in jail. That was the far right. The far left said, beat them up and put them in jail, because pre police brutality will cause a backlash, and there'll be a revolution, and will overthrow the government. So now, here's the measure coming up for a vote. How many are in favor of forcible, brutal, brutal repression? Hands go up. You don't know what they're voting for. One is voting for breaking the resistance and supporting the government, and the other is voting for overthrowing the government. Because their purposes are entirely different purposes. So, we're talking now about the Torah prescribing actions. Part of what the Torah prescribes is purposes. Part of what the Torah prescribes is state of mind, not just the motion of the body. So, for example, when the Torah says that you have to perform a certain mitzvah, you need to know that it's a mitzvah, and you need to intend, this is not purpose, this is intention. Purpose and intention are two different things. You need to intend that what you do satisfy the mitzvah that God commanded. If you don't intend that, it doesn't work. So, I'm a sofer, I'm writing a Torah scroll. Custom is, as you write the words, you say them. <clears throat> I'm an early riser, here I am, 7 a.m., and I'm writing. I'm fairly into the book of Deuteronomy, and I'm going, Shema, right? Yisrael, Hashem, okay, Hashem, Echot, the Shema. I wrote, all, I wrote all six words, I said all six words. Then look at my watch. Hey, it's 7.12. Time for saying the morning Shema. And I just said it. I just said the morning Shema. So I've done that mitzvah. No, I have not. 
Because when I said the words, I did not intend that my recital of the words satisfy the commandment. I was saying the words because I'm writing a Sefer Torah. So I have to go back and say it again. This has a profound implication. Can an atheist perform a commandment? On these grounds, the answer is no. He cannot perform a commandment. He can do an action that's identical to what the commandment requires, just like I said the Shema, identically to the commandment is recite the Shema. But I did not perform the commandment. To fulfill a commandment, you have to know there's a commander, know there's a commandment, and intend that what you do fulfill the commandment. You're in the army, and the sergeant says to you, gives you an order, close the door. But as happens in the Israeli army, the commander is an Ethiopian, and you're from Russia, and you don't understand his Hebrew. So he said something, you know, but that's like, maybe he was passing the time of day. Who knows? But meanwhile, you're cold. So you go and shut the door. Have you obeyed the command? Surely not. You don't even know there was a command. You haven't got a clue what he said. It just by accident happened that your action fulfilled what the command required. An atheist cannot perform any commandment. He can put on tefillin, and he can give charity, and he can seek justice. He gets no credit for fulfilling any commandments because an action, part of the definition of an action, is the purpose for which you act. And if you don't act for that purpose, if you don't act with that intention, then that's not the action that the Torah is describing. That's step one. Yeah. Is this only a positive commandment? Um, it will also apply to someone who has to choose to avoid a prohibition. We treat those, we treat those very similar. Uh, the Talmud says when, when a person's in a position where he, could, where he could eat a cheeseburger and he knows it's wrong and he says that I'm not going to eat the cheeseburger, he gets credit as if he had fulfilled a positive commandment. So the fact that it's positive or negative the question is, I'm making a choice, and I know that there's a commandment, and I'm acting in such a way to fulfill what the commandment requires. The fact that it's formally, legally, positive or negative doesn't make that difference. Well, I mean, it's a violation. Can you violate one if you don't know very well? Can the atheist violate a commandment? Well, the question is whether violate and, and fulfill are, are really symmetrical or not. It's tricky. That's tricky because there can be something called an unintentional violation or a negligent violation. And the, the Torah talks about that in great detail. So I'm, I'm just registering that it's not per perfectly symmetrical and there's more to be said, but I can't do it now because I've got a couple of other things I don't want to do now. Okay, that's the intention to fulfill the commandment. What about purpose? What goal should a person have when he fulfills the commandment? Well, let's start at the bottom. The Torah talks about reward and punishment. The person fulfills a commandment, he gets a reward. He violates a commandment, he gets a punishment. One motivation that people have for doing the right thing is, I want to get a reward and I don't want to be punished. Now, in a certain sense, that's low. In a certain sense, that's childish, as I will explain in a moment. But it's valid. In Jewish terms, it's valid. A person is motivated by total self-interest. I want the reward and I don't want to be punished will get rewarded and avoid punishment for what he did. It's valid and it works. In part because it's based on a true understanding of how God runs the world with reward and punishment. But it's low. It's low. It's childish. Imagine a person who said, steal? I don't steal. I don't steal. You know why? Because when I was 16 years old, my uncle got caught stealing, and he went to the jail, and I visited him in jail, and it was horrible, and I'm frightened to death of it, and I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to go to jail, and I can never trust that uh, if I take something, I won't be caught. That's why I don't steal. I think we feel that that person isn't fully mature. He's acting in a childish way. He doesn't know that stealing is wrong. He has no moral understanding. To him, not stealing is like not being overweight or not eating arsenic or just, you know, it's going to cost me. It's going to hurt, so I, I'm just protecting myself. A person without any moral understanding is not, I wouldn't say, I would say he's not fully mature, not fully adult, and he's certainly not in a position of honor. A much higher 
role is one, one who says, what I'm saying now needs several hours of elaboration, but I'm just using it for this discussion. The person who says, what God wants is right for the world. Not because he said so, but because of other things, a long, complicated story. But God says it, it's right for the world. And, as Maimonides and others put it, even if there were no reward, even if there were no reward, this is what I would do, because it's right, because it's good, because it's what the Creator wants for the world. It has its own value. It doesn't get value because it's a means to something good for me. On the contrary, I become valuable because I do it. Doing it gives my life value. I don't subjugate it to me. I subjugate myself to it because it has its own absolute value. That motivation is, may not be the very highest type of motivation, but that's, that's a very high type of motivation. And the Torah tells us that we should work to develop that kind of motivation. Doing it because it's right, doing it because it's good, doing it because God wants to do it, or as it's put sometimes, doing it out of love of God. Doing it out of love of God. Now, here's where we meet, need to lean on the first 35 minutes. The cynic says, that's a mirage. That's a mirage. It's impossible. No one ever does anything like that. The only goal you have in doing everything you do is only your own pleasure. Do it for God or because it's right. That's just a mirage. It never happens. That's why I need the discussion that I started with because if someone's convinced that that's all a mirage, then the Jewish, the Jewish tradition emphasizing it will sound like it's a fantasy. It has no connection with reality. But having disposed of the cynic's position, I think we can see now that what the Torah prescribes for us is not, is not a fantasy. It's something that's available in the real world. Now, I want to make a, cl a clarification and an illustration, and then I'll be finished. Um, the Torah teaches that people are created with two different types of motivation. There's a lot to say about this, but for our purposes, one selfish and one altruistic. The fact that God's motivation is only altruistic, he created the universe only to benefit us, and human being has a soul. That soul carries something of God into the world. All these words would need clarification, but I'm doing it tonight. Carries something, and what it carries, among other things, is the ability to act on behalf of others, on behalf of God, and on behalf of other people. And we also have selfish motivations. We're built with both. Since we're built with both, we can work to strengthen one and weaken the other. That's something which is common. We all experience that. We all experience psychological change, and sometimes we experience it by our own efforts. What would happen if a person lacked in his initial motivation set, in his initial gift of creation, a, a desire to, uh, to help others, he had no altruistic motivation whatsoever? I can't say this with certainty, but it seems to be like he'd be stuck. I don't see how you could create a category of motivation that wasn't there before. And I'll give you an example of where this occurs, mm -hmm. tragically. There's something called psychopathy. A psychopath will do something like this. If you have this knife, I don't want to carry this knife around. I need to put it someplace. I have two choices. I can put it on the table, or I can put it in your arm. Two choices. Now, experience has taught me that they had different consequences. I put it on the table, it makes a mark on the table, disfigures the table, you know, it blunts the knife to a certain extent because the table's hard. I put it in your arm, you're going to start to yell and scream and get blood all over everything, which is going to make things messy, and so on and so on. So I have to decide where I'm going to put it. You know, that's how he looks at it. He doesn't experience other people's pain. He doesn't experience it. The yell and scream might just as well be feedback to a speaker screaming. The pain of other people doesn't register. It doesn't register. He doesn't perceive it. That's horrible. He can't imagine what's wrong with putting the knife in another person's arm. So it causes a lot of noise. Okay, so I'll put an earplug. Now, go communicate to him. Build a bridge so that he will come to experience other people's pain. I don't know if that's possible. If you experience that, you're not sensitive to it enough, we can increase your sensitivity. God created us with both altruistic and selfish motivations. 
Those motivations are often in conflict with one another, not always, but often, and we can work to strengthen some over the other. Final illustration I want to give you is this. Let's imagine a father who has two sons. And the, the father is older and needs help, and the sons are dedicated. Dedicated, calls one or the other at 2.30 in the morning, and the son gets up, runs over the house, and does... And if you observe them, video them, they look exactly the same. Father calls, yes, Dad. What can I do for you? What do you need? You need me to come over? I'm coming. Comes in. Big smile. Yes. How can I help you? What can I do for you? They both act exactly the same. But the inner reality is quite different. One, when he gets the call, he sees the number and says, oh, no. Not again. Third time this week. I have to do it. My father, I owe it to him. I have to do it. I'll, give me two seconds to put on my right tone of voice. Hello, Dad. What can I do? <laughs> it's all it's play acting, but he does it because he knows the answer. He knows he's obligated to do it. He's dutiful. He's responsible. He fulfills his obligations with irritation, with pain, with upset. His father doesn't have a clue. He does it perfectly. The other son. When the call comes at 2.30 a.m., he gets on. He thinks, wow, an opportunity to do for my father. I love my father. I know that he's loved me. I know that he's invested me. I love him. When I have an opportunity to show him how much I love him, it's precious. It's a precious opportunity. See, the father calls up. Yes, Dad. What can I do? Same tone of voice. Same tone of voice. But the inner reality is utterly different. Now, the father who's watching the performance doesn't know there's any difference between them. Imagine the father on his deathbed somehow comes to understand the difference between the two sons. Whose performance is going to be more precious to him? The son who performed out of duty, responsibility, with irritation and pain, but overcame it? Or the son who responded out of love? I hope it's obvious that the father is going to be much more thrilled with the response of the son who does it out of love. The son who does it only out of duty and responsibility, there's something broken in him. There's something not fully human. Why doesn't he love his father? We're talking about a father who loved the son and invested in the son and cared for the son, protected the son. Why doesn't he love him back? Why not? There's something broken there. This is the difference between serving God out of love and serving God out of duty, obligation indebtedness, but with inner resistance, which you overcome because you're committed to doing the right thing. That's the idea of serving God out of love. That's the highest level of divine service. It's, divine, it's service of, of God because I want to do for God, and that is built on the foundation of what I said in the first 35 minutes, that it is possible to act on behalf of another, of an other. That's not an illusion. Questions? Then we left over. Okay, so I put on the title, True or False, so now you know that it's false. Okay. <laughs>